Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Senator Jason Lewis. Welcome, and uh, thank you very much for attending tonight's community forum, uh, community conversation, I should say. This is the fifth in our series of policy forums that we've been doing. They are designed to shed light on interesting and timely topics that affect our communities, and most importantly, to have a chance to solicit your uh, input, your ideas, and your feedback. Uh, I want to start by thanking um, state representatives um, Brad Jones and Jim Dwyer, uh, as well as the Reading Town uh, Manager, Bob Lesher, for uh, co-sponsoring the community conversation tonight, along with uh, the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, the Melrose Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, the Stoneham Substance Abuse Coalition, the Winchester Coalition for a Safer Community, Wakefield Unified Prevention, and the Malden Community Health Improvement. I see that every one of our communities has come up with a unique name for their substance abuse coalition. We also have a number of community leaders uh, with us tonight, um, and I want to thank them. We've got some uh, police chiefs with us, super, uh, several superintendents, members of uh, our boards of selectmen, city councils, school committee members, and, um, and very much appreciate uh, not just your attendance tonight, but all of your leadership. Uh, in our communities on uh, issues of uh, addiction and substance abuse and many other issues as well. As we know, our topic tonight is a very serious one, combating substance abuse and opioid addiction in our communities. So many of us have been touched personally through our own families, through our friends, by the scourge of this epidemic. We know that the reach of addiction crosses all boundaries, gender, age, income, ethnicity, geography. We stand together in support of those individuals and their families who are battling this terrible illness. And we mourn for those with us tonight who have lost loved ones. Yet there is also hope. I know we draw strength and inspiration from those who are now in recovery. And while much, much work remains to be done to stem the epidemic, I'm encouraged by the unprecedented efforts that are being undertaken at the state, regional, and local levels to significantly improve education, prevention, treatment, and recovery supports. Tonight, we have an amazing opportunity to hear from the leaders of these efforts and for you to share with them your experiences, your ideas, and your feedback. So here's the agenda for the evening. First, we will hear from Secretary Sutters and Commissioner Burrell about efforts that are underway at the state level. Then, District Attorney Ryan will speak about regional and law enforcement initiatives. Finally, we will hear from Penny Fignoli and Erica McNamara about what is happening on the ground here in our communities. I think this will take about 45 minutes, and then uh, we should have plenty of time for your questions and for discussion with our panelists. I know perhaps one or two of our panelists may have to leave a little early, but um, we will, um, the others will be able to stay for uh, as much, much questions and discussion as, uh, as you would like. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first two speakers this evening. Appointed as Secretary of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services by Governor Baker in January of this year, Mary Lou Sutters leads the largest agency in our state government. With a $21 billion budget and 22,000 employees who deliver critical services that touch almost one in four residents of the Commonwealth. Secretary Sutters previously served as the Commissioner of the State Department of Mental Health from 1996 to 2003 before she took over as President of the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and most recently leading Boston College's Health and Mental Health Graduate Program. Professionally trained as a social worker, Secretary Sutters has dedicated her life to public service and to helping some of our most vulnerable citizens. Dr. Monica Burrell was appointed by Secretary Sutters to head the Massachusetts Department of Public Health in February 2015. In this role, she's responsible for spearheading the state's response to the opioid crisis as well as implementing many other vital public health programs and initiatives. Dr. Burrell previously served as the Chief Medical Officer of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, which is the largest nonprofit healthcare organization for homeless individuals anywhere in the country. She has served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, 
Boston University Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health. And let me add, uh, as the um, Senate Chair of the Public Health Committee, I have the great pleasure of working very closely with Commissioner Burrell, and it's just, um, it's such a treat to be able to work with her and her staff. They do amazing work uh, every day on behalf of our Commonwealth. Secretary Sutters and Commissioner Burrell recently led the Governor's Special Opioid Working Group, which some of you I'm sure have heard about, and we will hear more about their work and their recommendations tonight. So without further ado, please join me in giving both Secretary Sutters and Commissioner Burrell a very warm welcome. Actually, no one's ever accused me of not being able to project. So, so first of all, um, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. I want to thank um, Sarah Lewis, who's been a strong champion on public health issues. It's always, and actually, you know what? This is a terrific lineup, um, not because we're all women, um, just because we're all women, um, but it really represents in our minds the face of really dealing with opioid crisis in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is the executive branch, working very closely with law enforcement and my my district attorney, because I'm a I live in Middlesex County, Marion Ryan, and local communities, because it's going to take all of us to really um, deal with the opioid uh, epidemic in the Commonwealth. I'm going to be brief, and I'm thrilled to be here actually with Commissioner Burrell, um, who is the state commissioner of public health. Um, as he said, so this is what half a state government looks like. Uh, yes, I am responsible for 21 billion of the $38 billion state budget. But one of the governor's top five priorities for health and human services is in fact the opioid crisis in the Commonwealth. Um, uh, he didn't run on this issue, as people have heard him say, but everywhere he went, someone talked to him about heroin or opioids. And the more he was in people's houses and talking to people, the more he needed to understand about it. So there's just a couple, so I chaired the governor's working group, listened to, held listening sessions in, um, across the Commonwealth in a couple of months, right after we took office, listened to more than 1,100 individuals like you tonight, um, stories of heartache, heartbreak, hope, recovery, um, what can we do, how fast can we move. And I'm just gonna give you a few <coughs> statistics from that. So from all those listening sessions, this is where maybe it's helpful that I am a social worker. I understand people in the context of their environments, it's how I'm trained as a social worker. So put together a um, multifaceted, multi-year um, set of recommendations for the governor, 55 very specific recommendations. You can go on www.mass.gov, happy to leave the website to see the recommendations. I update it every month so people can see what, actually what we're doing. Um, it's classic public health approach from prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. But here's a couple of facts um, for all of us. So last year in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there were 4.4 million prescriptions written by Massachusetts prescribers for Massachusetts citizens, resulting in 240 million pills. Um, Schedule twos and schedule threes, I'm not expecting all of you to know what those are, but those are basically your benzodiazepines, so Ativan and Xanax, and then uh, the opioids. Um, that's a lot of pills out there. That's just from one calendar year. Um, the other um, statistic, which is the startling one, I think, for many people, is that four times more people die now in the Commonwealth from opioid deaths than um, car accidents. Right, it's just, yeah. That's what I said when I first heard. Um, and today and every day, four people will die in the Commonwealth. The other thing, and I'm really grateful that, um, so for me, first responders right now in the opioid crisis are our police departments and our EMTs and our fire departments. And there's a few here tonight. And so I just, on behalf of the Commonwealth, want to thank you for what you do each and every day. This is not a new issue for the Commonwealth, um, heroin and opioids but it has just cascaded, right? It's hit Reading, it's hit Winchester, it's hit Mel Rose and all of our communities. Um, the other point I wanna make before I hand this over to Commissioner Brow is it's also really important for us to remember 
that people with addictions are not a homogeneous group. Um, many people have become addicted to heroin through opioids, but there's many reasons why people become also addicted to heroin. It's not solely through the path of opioids. It might be at a party where someone is convinced for whatever reason by someone to try something, and it's incredibly, so it's incredibly important as we come up with strategies to deal with the opioid crisis in the Commonwealth is to remember there's not gonna be a one size fits all. And addictions, and I'm sure there's many people who have experienced this in your own families, um, know that addictions is a chronically relapsing disease. And so we need to be in the treatment for the long haul. We're completely committed, and I get into the details, um, about what we're doing specifically in the Commonwealth, but it's really important when people say, so if you just do this, this will fix this. That just like uh, my whole space has been in the world of mental illness for many, many years. It's an illness that affects my family. I have three family members. They all have a very different illness. Um, and I, so it's really important to remember that the face of addictions is many different faces. And our treatment strategies need to be very responsive to the individual needs and the underlying causality of what has caused that. I'm really here to listen to all of you tonight, so I'm gonna turn this over to my, my good friend, the wonderful Commissioner of Public Health. These are the people who make my job look easy, sort of. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, and thank you for having us here today. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your evenings to be with us. This is such an important issue. Um, you know, I want to start by saying as, um, I'm a, um, came to the Department of Public Health after a couple of decades working as a primary care internist um, in Boston. And I have, um, in all my years, and worked very closely with individuals suffering from substance use disorder. And in all my years, I have not seen such a concerted effort that Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters have led, along with our judiciary and legislative partners, in addressing this issue. So this is really an important time. The problem is worsening, but also the capacity and the ability for all of us to work together to think about real solutions is now. So um, I, I'm really glad to be a part of that. Um, you know, it would, to me, success would look like uh, when I had a patient with diabetes who would come in and need assistance with a symptom related to the diabetes or a high sugar, blood sugar that they were having, I knew where to send them from my clinic and I was able to get them the immediate care they needed. And whether that was outpatient care or intensive care, unit care, it was accessible to everybody. And the hope is that when we have individuals who are suffering from substance use disorder, addiction in the form of substance use disorder, that we can access care in the same way. This is a chronic medical disease and we have to begin treating it that way. Um, and you know, us talking about it and working together and listening to each other is really an important step in that. The other thing I want to emphasize is some of the prevention work we're doing. You heard the Secretary speak about prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, and we're happy to talk more about the details. But two, two areas of prevention are areas for um, all of us in our communities to think about prevention before individuals are using or to be able to pick up early signs and be able to help people find the resources that they need. And I urge you all, if you haven't, to take the pledge. Um, we have a campaign right now, State Without Stigma. If you could all take the pledge to join us, because one of the things that people talk about is about the stigma and the shame associated with substance use disorder and being, quote unquote, an addict. And we really want individuals to see this as the disease that it is and not a choice that individuals make. Um, so your support in that is really important. The other thing just to emphasize so you're aware about, the other piece of education is around prescribers. You heard Secretary Sutter speak about the numbers of prescriptions and pills that are available, and we're working really hard to make sure that prescribers have the education and the tools that they need to effectively balance 
the need for pain control, appropriate pain control, with the dangers of opioid misuse. And part of that, one tool we have for that is the prescription monitoring system that's available for prescribers to use so that they can understand the full picture when they have an individual in front of them of what medications they've had. It's also a tool for us to use at the state level to understand the patterns of prescribing and areas where we need to pay additional attention. To give you one example of how we've used this data, we know from the prescription monitoring system that the most number of medications with abuse potential are actually prescribed to individuals in the 51 to 70 year old range. So although we need to really focus our prevention efforts with young individuals, we also need to do work with our senior citizens so that we all understand what the use of these drugs are, but also the potential misuse, how to store them, and how to um, dispose of them. Thank you, dispose of them when you don't need them anymore. So there are ways that we are um, using this information that we're getting at the state level to focus our efforts. In addition to that, having um, gone to medical school and worked with a lot of doctors in training, I know that we need to do a much better job of educating our prescribers about how to talk to individuals about these medications and how to become more comfortable with substance use disorder and the treatment. So we're working, um, we just released, um, in combination with the deans of the medical schools, core competencies that are um, for all medical students to receive, and those are really a first in the nation, um, and we hope to um, extend that to dentists and other prescribers as well. Um, and finally, on the um, last note on um, first responders, um, again, a first in the nation. Our first responders in Massachusetts were some of the first to take on using Narcan, which has been really um, life-saving. And we have recorded um, over 35,000 individuals trained in the use of Narcan and at least 5,000 overdose reversals. So um, really a place of innovation and um, look forward to talking with you more about our efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Sutters and Commissioner Burrell. And let me just also echo, I think it's uh, so important that um, uh, they have launched the, the, the campaign uh, to destigmatize uh, substance abuse. And it's uh, state without stigma, right? The M-A, M-A, which I thought was very clever. And I've taken the pledge, and, and yes, good Mark, we need good branding. And I encourage those of you here tonight, take the pledge and uh, put it on social media so others can see, you know, you as community leaders are out there, you know, making it clear that we need to destigmatize, bring this out into the open, and uh, so people can get the care that they need. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan, who brings more than three decades of experience prosecuting the state's most violent felons, fighting for victims, and creating innovative crime prevention initiatives. Prior to becoming District Attorney, DA Ryan served as General Counsel and as Chief of the Elder and Disabled Unit in the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. DA Ryan, as many of you know, has also been a great leader in mobilizing regional efforts to combat the opioid epidemic. We're thrilled to have her with us tonight, and let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight and for thinking about this and the work that you're doing in this area. I want to do a couple of things in the time that I have so that we give you plenty of time to ask questions. And the first is to give you a little bit of history about where we are addressing this issue in Middlesex County. And one of the things that, if you haven't picked up already, we have some packets for you outside. And you'll see in the packet a map of Middlesex County. And one of the things that I think it's important to remember about this is you pick up the newspaper, you turn on the television, you hear about these numbers. And at some point, the numbers just kind of all blur together. And you forget that every single one of those numbers is a real incident. It actually happened in someone's house, in the restroom of a fast food establishment, on the street. And the map that you'll see reflects the deaths that have occurred in Middlesex County. And the way that we track that information, I have 21 state troopers assigned to my office. 
They respond to every unattended, so that is somebody who doesn't die in a hospital or in hospice care, every unattended death. So the, those numbers, we know the accuracy of because a trooper sitting in my office physically went out and responded, physically saw the, that person, saw that family. And when you look at them, and you look across the scope of Middlesex County, which has 54 cities and towns, 1.7 million people, you will see that as of today, in this calendar year, we've had 173 deaths. You will see, which will probably surprise you, that of the 54 cities and towns, as of today, because there are three that aren't recording because they just happened in the last two days, there are only nine cities and towns that have not had police departments and state troopers responding to a fatality. And we have an enormous, and I always say the wonderful thing about Middlesex County is it's like a social laboratory. We have urban areas, rural areas, suburban areas, we have very wealthy towns. We have blue collar towns. We have real inner city areas. And there is absolutely no difference. And if you were to take this map and overlay a highway now, you would see that there are many towns and cities that maybe you wouldn't expect to see so many deaths in. But if you overlay 95 and 93, you see that they go right through those cities and towns. And that is because many times there's a transaction that's taking place right off the highway. So the people may have no particular connection. They're meeting up in the Dunkin' Donuts or the Burger King at the exit. There's a purchase. Someone then goes into the fast food place to use and they've gotten either a bad dose or they use too much and they overdose. So there is a face for every one of the people on here. And we, as we do this, that's one of the things that, and I'll talk a little bit about our future plan, we have really tried not to lose sight of it. Because the numbers just become overwhelming. And about four and a half years ago, we started to see what you'll see reflected on that map. And that was an incredible increase in the number of opiate deaths up in the Merrimack Valley. And at that point, it seemed to be an isolated problem. And the numbers were going up so fast that it was clear that this was not just a public safety issue, but it was a public health issue. So we convened a hospital task force because, as you might be shocked to learn, there are people who don't like to come to the DA's office and don't like to come to the police station. So, uh, but people are all okay with going to the hospital. And we wanted people to understand this wasn't just law enforcement that had to be acting on this. That task force that we began up there has continued for four and a half years. We meet once a month. It has been an incredible effort by people who come to that table every month from every possible discipline. And we have accomplished incredible things as we developed a multi-pronged approach that looked at education, prevention, intervention, legislation, and we've had wonderful partners like Senator Lewis in some of those efforts, Enforcement, because we should make no mistake about the fact that there are lots of people who are making very large amounts of money from this. There are enormous amounts of opiate pills and kilos of heroin that are moving through the Commonwealth. And that has really been our focus, putting a stop to that, putting a stop to the trafficking. Just last week, the governor signed a bill making it a crime to traffic in fentanyl. 100 times more potent than heroin. Used to cut heroin so that it is more profitable. It is responsible for an endless number of the overdoses we see. And the reason it is, and there's a very simple analogy that I think sort of explains and people don't necessarily understand what fentanyl is. If you are making chili and you put in your meat and you put in your sauce and you put in all the spices, and you find out 20 more people are coming, you put a whole lot more sauce in, but now it doesn't taste so good. So you start throwing more chili powder in, and you might stir it up and you work on it, but when you take a taste of that chili, 
If you get the spoon that's got a lot of chili powder in it, big taste. That's what happens with fentanyl. Remember, it's 100 times more potent than heroin. It's mixed in with the heroin. And as I say all the time when I am in schools, the Food and Drug Administration is not examining how they're mixing that in. So when it's in there, it's very easy for, to get what's called the hot load. The bag you get happens to be the one with all the chili powder in it. And so when people, even very, very experienced users, get that bag, which is an amount they have safely used before, they have not accounted for the enormous dose of fentanyl that's in that bag, and it kills them. And up until last week in Massachusetts, it was perfectly legal to have these enormous amounts to traffic and these enormous amounts of fentanyl because nobody had realized how significant it was and what an impact it was having. So think about it. We all want to be good at what we do every day. If your career is making money from drugs, which would you choose? To travel with the large quantities of something that you can't be punished for trafficking in? Would it be riding around with a couple of kilos of heroin in the back seat? So we had lots of people who found it much better risk to be traveling with a large amount of fentanyl. That now, now we have a new tool for law enforcement to be using in that effort. And also we wanted to be looking at treatment. And that's one of the things I want to talk about in terms of going forward. So you'll see in the packet as well a long list of the things that we've done, the education pieces, the legislation we filed, the efforts that we've done in using, and I take great pleasure in being able to use the funds. The legislature allows us to use funds that are taken after conviction from drug dealers, and they're allowed to be used in drug prevention efforts. So we've used a lot of that money to buy the disposal boxes that are in the police departments, to train folks on the use of Narcan, to buy for all of the 54 cities and towns, police and fire departments, an initial 10 doses of Narcan. And it's been gratifying to see that many cities and towns have taken that to be seed effort and they've now funded the Narcan. We have trained schools, we've trained athletic directors. You know, Narcan is not a solution, but it gives people the opportunity to fight another day. We've also partnered with the real estate brokers. And you might think real estate is kind of an odd way to fight drug efforts. But think about it, when you move to a town, you almost always have to interact with a realtor. You're buying a house, you're renting a house. We want them to have the education piece about how dangerous this is and to be acquainting people with those resources. And the other part is we began to see that lots of the drugs, the prescription drugs that people had, were coming from open houses. So on Sunday, you go to an open house, the broker lets you walk through the house, and you're examining the bathroom. Now, I'm not going to ask anyone here to raise your hand, but think about your medicine cabinet at home, and think about how many people have in the back of that medicine cabinet a few extra of something. You got a prescription for something, you didn't need them all, and they're sitting in the back. If someone at that open house helps themselves to that prescription, you are never going to miss it, because you don't even remember it's there. So the other piece of it is, and this is again good news, bad news, in Middlesex County, we are fortunate to have an elderly population, and that's anyone over the age of 60, that is 10% higher than the rest of the state. What that means is many people have the good fortune to be aging in place in their town. What it also means is what comes with most people who get to an advanced age, a shoebox, and for some reason it's often a shoebox, full of prescriptions. They're in the house. They are in the house for the person who's there for the real estate open house. They're in the house for the teenagers in the family and their friends. They're in the house for people who may be in the throes of addiction, whether it's caretakers or the cleaning people or anybody else. And when eventually that senior leaves the house and maybe moves to an assisted living or somewhere else, they can't take those prescriptions with them because the facilities don't let you. Or maybe they succumb to some of their illnesses. And there's a shoebox left. Those were all disappearing during open houses. 
So all of the realtors that have joined with us now have bags to provide to people that are gonna be showing their houses to say, seal your prescriptions here and take them with you. Empty out your medicine cabinet and dispose of what's in there. And be educating yourself about what's in your house and where you're gonna, what you're gonna do with it. When Nana moves out of the house, you take that box down to the police station and put it in that disposal box. So those are just some of the pieces of education that we've been doing. We've reached out with, in terms of the task forces that we've had, we've been instrumental in getting beds opened up at Tewksbury State Hospital for more treatment. So there's a, a whole range of things that we've been doing. You'll see that list. But the other piece of this, and what's become very clear, and I think this is also where we have to be looking, is this is not a problem that's gonna be solved in 2015 or 2016. This is a longer term problem. And it is a future problem, particularly in two ways. We have eight birthing hospitals in Middlesex County. The smallest of our birthing hospitals, the smallest, is delivering on average one substance exposed newborn every week. So if that's the smallest, imagine what's happening in our bigger birthing hospitals. So we have to be thinking as a community about those children. What kind of costs are associated, first of all, with the care, leaving aside the human cost of the suffering they endure, but what kind of actual financial cost is there? What, how are those costs gonna continue in terms of are they gonna have some deficits that are gonna require additional spending later on? And then the, the really bigger human question is, where are they gonna live? Are they, are they going to be in a situation where they can go home with their mother? Is that gonna be a safe place for them? So as a piece of that, we have joined with all of our birthing hospitals. We've been able to secure a grant to really be reaching out to people at the earliest stages of their pregnancy. Because we know that that is a point where people might be open to intervention. And to be talking to people about services, not only treating the mother, because it's not enough to try to treat that addiction knowing that, that recovery often has setbacks. You have to have that child in a safe setting, but also providing a model that will give wraparound services for the first several years of that child's life so that we can ensure that a mother who's in treatment, working towards recovery, is able to safely have that child. That's an important piece of the future. The second piece is, Remember I told you that each one of those deaths happens on a personal level. And about four or five months ago, I began to see more and more that when our troopers and the local police departments were responding, there was a child present. I'll just give you one example and then I want you to think a little bit about how this impacts the future. We had one case where mother was deep in her addiction. She had moved with her seven-year-old into her parents' home. So living in the home with the grandparents, the mother, and the seven-year-old. On this particular evening, the seven-year-old realized her mother had gone into the bathroom, perhaps because of what she might have seen before. She was worried when her mother was in the bathroom for a long time. Started banging on the bathroom door. No answer. Eventually gets the grandmother. Grandmother can't get access to the bathroom calls the police, police respond. You can guess the rest, the door's forced open and the mother's having an overdose on the bathroom floor. First responders come, CPR started, Narcan, all kinds of efforts, a very young woman to revive the mother. She's taken out of the home, she does not survive. So as adults, looking at that situation, we have a seven-year-old who has just seen what any one of us, if we saw someone experiencing here, would be an unbearable trauma. Has just seen that played out right there. No way to help that. Has lost their parent. Has lived, at least for some period of time, in a home where drug use was normalized. Because that wasn't the first time the mother had used. We know there is a genetic component to addiction. We know that that is a child who very soon is going to be at that age, that 12, 13 year old age of experimentation. 
and it was going to be trying to fill the hole left by the loss of that parent. So as adults, can we be surprised when in five, six years, we're seeing that child either in the court system, behavioral issues in school, any of those pieces. And it's our responsibility, these are our children. It's our responsibility to be thinking about that piece. So we have begun partnering with our police departments first that have embedded mental health workers to have those mental health workers responding right away with the police that are out there. Because the other, and again, it's a good news, bad news, in Middlesex County, we have lots of situations like that where the grandparents or the other family members have the resources that that child will remain there. So that child will be physically and financially cared for. But they will now be living in a situation where you already have parents grieving the loss of their child. Think about how many of us will think maybe it's best not to raise that with the child. They'll get over it. So the mental health of that child is probably not going to be paramount and thinking about what's happening. But we need to be addressing that. In, the, in an instance that we had a couple of weeks ago, the first responders found a three and a five-year-old. Again, witnessed the whole episode unfold. Using those embedded mental health workers, we were able by the next morning to have those children who are obviously too young for traditional therapy be in play in our therapy to start dealing with that trauma. That is something we're gonna to have to be doing on an ongoing basis. The other piece is looking at treatment. There's a na national rallying cry. We have to have treatment. And we do. We clearly have to have treatment. But the issue that's important is dollars and ability to pay for treatment is finite at some level. So we have to be finding what really works for treatment. We have to be clear about what is treatment. Detox is not treatment. You can go to detox 20 times. And then frankly, if you leave detox and you don't have a place to go, you are much more at risk for an overdose. So we need to be knowing what, have the same, be on the same page in terms of definition of what treatment is, what treatment works. Because one of the things, when I started thinking about this, one of the things that's pretty scary is that if you look at any number of treatment programs, I don't care how expensive they are, I don't care where they are, and look at the long-term recovery rate and the relapse rate. The relapse rates are high, and that's a part of recovery, five or six relapses at least. And long-term recovery in many programs is actually very low. We, we shouldn't be investing in those programs. We should be investing in the programs or the strategies that are most effective. To that end, we have put together a mobile public policy forum, which we've been doing across the county, we did one last night, where we have asked people in long-term recovery to join us to talk about what has been successful, what has not been successful, when they might have been open for intervention, and really use that to inform us, to inform our legislative partners, to inform law enforcement and looking at helping people find treatment, what is really successful. So those are we are, so at the same time we are going there, knowing that this is a long-term issue, as well as keeping in place all of the ground forces we put together. And the thing that is what I think is the driving force and makes us know we have to be doing this a little bit differently is, as you heard, I've been a prosecutor for a very long time, decades and decades. And so I've been a prosecutor long enough to see social issues where we have changed the course of what we're doing. When I started in the district attorney's office, we had somewhere over 2,000 people who died every year on the highways of Massachusetts in alcohol-related crashes. And finally, people said, that's it. This is just crazy. And organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving and others really rallied. And behavior changed. I would guess there are many people in this room who remember when the holidays were a season of lots of parties, everybody drank as much as possible, and we all hoped everybody got home okay. Nobody does that anymore. 
And those, the numbers in Massachusetts, and they are still too many, now are at less than 250. That's an enormous drop. I'm sure many of you remember when everybody smoked in their office. They smoked in restaurants. They smoked everywhere. People are horrified now if you're in a restaurant and you light a cigarette. That was a change. So what is interesting and what compels us to have these conversations and to act differently is you have seen in this room tonight and you've certainly seen in the media, there has probably never been a social issue that has compelled so much attention and so many resources. What's the result? In this case, it's going in the wrong direction because the numbers are going up. What we need to know from that is that so many of the traditional paths that we have taken are not being successful. That's why things like these programs to begin with babies, to be treating children, to be offering different kinds of treatment are the way that we have to go. We have to be innovative. And that requires what you see in this room tonight, what you would not have seen 15 years ago. Treatment providers, police chiefs, legislators, all of us here talking this through, trying different strategies, and developing a way to reverse the trend in this issue. So I'm happy to have been with you tonight. I'm happy to join Senator Lewis in this effort and applaud the work that he has done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, District Attorney Ryan. You, you spoke so eloquently about the tragic cases with young children that you and, and your uh, police officers and first responders have encountered. And, you know, I met um, recently with a group of grandparents, um, and, uh, you know, there's just been this tremendous number, uh, increase in grandparents who are raising children. Why were most of those grandparents raising their grandchildren? Because their children, the parents of the, of the grandchildren, because of, of opioid addiction, substance abuse, you know, they're not capable of raising their own children anymore. So the, um, the ramifications and all the ancillary impact of this epidemic um, on children, on grandparents, on our hospitals, on our law enforcement, it's just, um, you know, it's just really tremendous. Um, so uh, now our last uh, two wonderful speakers tonight are gonna bring things from a state level and a regional level down to what's happening in our schools, what are we doing there, and in our, in our neighborhoods. And to help us with this perspective, we have um, Penny Pignoli. Um, Penny is the Mystic Valley Regional Opiate Abuse Prevention Coordinator. And we have Erica McNamara, who is the director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. I'm sure many of you here tonight already know Penny and Erica, and they hardly need an introduction. They do just terrific, terrific work every day um, here in our communities. So we're delighted to have them, and please join me in welcoming Penny and Erica. I, I was speaking today, and I um, ran out of breath because I'm nine months pregnant, so I might have to get a drink of water. Okay, so. Um, Yep, Penny Fanioli, Mystic Valley Opioid Abuse Prevention Coordinator. I am not that person anymore. Brooke Hoyt is now taking over that position. I was uh, appointed to a sustainable position, and a local ordinance was created for a job in Medford to oversee all prevention program, which is the epitome of prevention sustainability, so we're very proud of that over in Medford. Um, but oh, I will still be working with Brooke to oversee this work. Um, and I've been doing it for the last two and a half years, so I kind of know a lot about it. Um, what we've done really started a while back. In 2012, um, Melrose and Reading and Medford, we were all separately reaching out to partners at Hallmark Health and saying, you know, we really need to get into the hospital. We want to know some more information about data. How can we get data? Um, do you know about SPERT? Do you know about these things? So we were all reaching out. And, the, and Helmer Gell said, look, we, we should just start meeting together. So we started this um, informal kind of coalition that we started uh, working together on this. The opportunity came about for the, Mo the MOPSI grant, the Massachusetts Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative Grant, and Medford was the, the best slated community to write for it, so we did. And since then, um, a part of that grant was to do a year-long assessment of what is the issue in, this com in our communities, in the six communities, Medford, Malden, Melrose, Stoneham, Wakefield, and Reading. And um, 
We found, a lot, we found out a lot of stuff throughout that process. We used uh, met multiple methods of data collection that were at our fingertips, so collecting death records in our clerk's offices. And those death records are a little bit different than what the state would report because the state cleans them up. They, they look at um, intentional and unintentional deaths. And I'm just literally going through and looking for, was there an opioid in that person's system? And those records have been really valuable to tell us and sort of paint a picture about what's been going on in our area. Um, and then the youth data, in, uh, interviews with the key stakeholders, things like that, pulled all that together, came up with a plan that really worked um, to serve all of our communities and some some strategies that would serve one community that but then um, breed a practice for the other communities. And that's what our, our plan was. Um, so since then, we keep track of that data still. We kind of keep an eye on it. And one thing that I will say that we've seen um, that didn't occur us in the first round is that on your death records, they have occupation of the individual that passed away. So in some of our communities, we started collecting those, de those occupations. And so I don't have the exact number, but of the documented um, occupations, 36% in this region were tradespersons, electricians, roofers. In Medford alone, it's 44% of those people who overdosed and died were um, in a trade. So that's a targeted population that we really want to work towards working with. The unions, talking to them, seeing what they're doing with their you know, employee assistance programs or how that's working and what, what's going on there and how we can be of support to them. So that's like an emerging issue that we're looking towards. Another emerging issue that we're looking towards is um, working directly with um, public bathrooms, people who have public bathrooms that are, you know, there have been overdoses. But in general, what we're gonna do is start working through our public health departments, our food inspectors go into all these restaurants, anyhow, and, and, and public, um, you know, the convenience stores, things like that. And so there, we're gonna teach them to do brief overdose training, overdose prevention training. And then we're gonna ask them further going forward, do you want more information? Do you wanna be more involved with this? Then we'll talk about other ways that they can continue to prevent. So those are emerging things that we're doing. But we've had a couple of successful um, strategies that we're really proud of. Um, again, our plan was submitted to the state in 2014, May 2014, and we've been working in teams um, on different projects. And one of the projects we worked on was um, the coaches training, because we feel that coaches are influential. We saw that athletes were overwhelmingly in our assessment at, at high risk. Over and over again, he was a good kid, he played sports, he did this, she did this. So, so we, we used that as um, our sort of jumping point. And we were actually the first out of all of the MOPSIs in the state to start working on that issue. And we're luckily getting a lot of calls from people asking for advice. Um, so we have a coaches training that we're gonna be implementing in the spring with coaches throughout our region. And that's just not like um, athletics in the public schools, we wanna go further down. It's a broad training. It talks about everything from alcohol, tobacco, all the way up to all the way up to opioids, prescription drugs, and injury prevention, things like that. Um, but another one, we have two other ones that are very successful. We have a resource guide that we've created. We find, I found, it's, it's really difficult to get people's attention when you're handing them six different pamphlets for six different reasons. So we decided to put it all in one home. And it took us a long time. We actually started that project in 2012. Multiple interns coming through and getting us you know, the help that we needed, but we finally finished it. And we've gotten at least 600 copies to doctor's offices in our region, through the Hallmark Health Networks, through other um, you know, um, doctor's networks. But then the sheriff's office got really excited about it, and they are now giving, they're printing it for the, through their own house, but they're giving a copy to every single inmate on, upon release in Middlesex County. So that's really exciting for us as well. Um, and then we worked on a stigma campaign. So we saw it in our assessment. We saw it last year when we did a regional dialogue with Senator Lewis. Stigma was overwhelmingly an important thing to talk about. So if it's okay, I'd like to show you two PSAs that we've put together through our committee. Um, a lot of vetting, a lot of going through the state's process of making sure that we're doing this right. Um, but there's two of them, and they'll both be shown from Friday, tomorrow, till December 25th at the Wuburn Theater. Um, every, single, every single viewing of any movie is gonna go at the front of that. And then in Revere, one of them, this encouragement one, will we'll play um, for every showing. So I don't know if we can take it away.
There are so many negative ways you can refer to someone who struggles with addiction. But it's the positive ones that will help someone on their road to recovery. Stigma is one of the leading barriers to seeking treatment. By offering encouragement instead of judgment, you can help break down the barrier. And the next one addresses a different angle. At least two of these people are suffering from addiction. Don't know who? It's hard for us to tell, too. Addiction touches us all. Stigma is one of the leading barriers to seeking treatment. Knowing that, you can help break down the barrier. So. <laughs> We're uh, very proud of that. <laughs> Those. Um, and it took quite a, quite a bit of time. We, 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 um, you know, we recruited people who were in recovery to help us come up with these videos, um, with the concepts. And then we also went back and we went to a Medford Families Anonymous. It's a really wonderful resource for us. And they, um, they gave us feedback, what they felt about it, and what they liked and what they thought we should change. So we're really excited about that. We have two more campaigns that we're going to be working on um, through this uh, particular initiative that we paid for. So we've already paid for the work, so, so that's really good. Um, but we also started the Stigma Prevents Change campaign um, back way back um, when we were doing our assessment in 2013, we were putting out facts with stigma prevents change and just kind of kept up with it. So those are some really great um, things that we're proud of that we've implemented. We've, we said we were going to do some stuff. We've done some stuff. We have more things that we want to get, get done to do. Um, we've also been working a lot with supporting grassroots or um, groups that have been um, coming up and doing, and doing their, um, you know, getting their, the word out. And you know what, quite honestly, they're doing a better job because they're more in touch with the individuals that are suffering from this. Um, and so really leveraging them in the best way possible, but in hopes to also teach them like what it is that we're actually doing. And one thing that we found that um, through our work as a team of prevention specialists is that prevention is very tricky to explain to people. Prevention is a process. It's a process that takes savvy, to be able to implement and, and it takes a lot of patience to put up with because we'll see change. We'll see change in five and 10 years. We see change in all, a lot of our communities and Erica will talk about Reading, but in Medford, we've seen d decline in underage drinking, marijuana use, prescription drug use, you name it. We've seen decline because we've been working on it for 10 years. Um, and it's about being strategic. It's about setting a plan. We identify the problem, we lay out a strategy, we are flexible with that strategy to make sure that we are going around the barriers that are there, removing them and or maybe changing the plan a little bit, and then identifying that outcome and working towards changing that outcome. So we've seen great success um, when we're using this right. And we are capable of doing so much more with that model. And it doesn't just have to be primary prevention. We could be doing relapse prevention. We could be helping people who are going into recovery outside, out of treatment and figuring out ways to mobilize the community. Maybe it's business setting up a business network that will hire new individuals who just recently left, left recovery. Maybe it's working with businesses to create um, funding for a recovery center in the area. So we could be doing that, but it really is just a matter of you know, what's the scope and where are we going and what's the need and then how, how is the funding going to allow for that, right? So those are things that we... We are um, hoping in the future. We want to continue to, you know, press on. And I think I think uh, we've been doing a pretty good job. And I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing. And I'm going to let Erica take it away for the rest of the show. Thanks, Penny. Um, being part of the regional work group over the last couple years has been very educational for myself and Julianne DeAngelis, my colleague at the Reading Coalition, because it gives us a chance to sit with other prevention specialists and with our partners at Hallmark and some of our uh, mental health support services and really strategize and come up with 
the best strategy that affects all of us, because we know in Reading for the past 10 years doing this prevention work that we weren't alone, but sometimes you feel alone. And so being able to reach across to your neighbors and know that they're in the same boat and we can help each other means a lot. We're so excited to, to see Stoneham come together with their coalition. When we started this process, they weren't yet a formal coalition, so we're really proud of the work. I see the blue Stoneham t-shirt, so shout out to Stoneham, you guys are doing great. Um, I wanted to say a few words about what we've been able to do in Reading. We've had funds from the Office of National Drug Control Policy for the last 10 years, and also um, resources from the state that have been very helpful in helping us use that strategic prevention framework process that Penny mentioned. And one of the first areas that we focused on was underage drinking, because when we looked at our data, it was overwhelmingly clear that alcohol was our number one deal that was affecting our young people. We're really excited to report that the latest round of data that we looked at for 2015 we showed a 16% decrease in underage drinking amongst our middle schoolers and a 10% decrease amongst our high schoolers in underage drinking. Prevention can work, it does work, but in order to get there, we needed to change policy at the town level. We needed our police officers to change how they were working and their procedures, how they interacted with young people. We added a diversion program working with the district attorney's office. Um, we also looked at our health education programming, our um, Reading Public Schools, um, access to mental health first aid grant. We're looking at stigma. This is a very comprehensive process. Um, when you look at how complex the issue of substance abuse is, we have to have that multifaceted response. But I say the, I bring up the underage drinking piece because when we talk about prevention in young people, if we're gonna do opioid prevention right, it is about underage drinking, it's about marijuana use, it's about prescription drugs, and it's also about inhalants and some of the other substances they're still using. So if we're doing our job right as primary prevention specialists, we're bringing up those issues. So if you hear us talking about them, we know opioids are happening, <laughs> but we also know that young people are not necessarily starting with them. And we also know that people use to change how they feel. So for me, as someone who's worked in prevention for 20 years, what I want to look at is why do we want to change how we feel? If I'm a young person and I'm struggling, what is going on? Is it to have fun? Am I struggling at home? What else is going on? That's what we're really trying to get at because we want to have a healthier community. So yes, it's about the uh, upper level of getting people to treatment. That is all very important and that's the crisis work that sometimes as prevention folks we're not able to do. But what we want to focus on is how to prevent people from getting to that level. If we can do earlier intervention, that would be amazing. We're excited to share that in the last year we've trained 365 people in youth mental health first aid. That's adults working in the Reading Public Schools and our town library who are now trained to refer people to services. And what we learned through that process was dealing with stigma. As we were educating people, people talked about issues in their own family. So as adults, we also have to confront this stuff and deal with it. How do you really feel about this issue? Why do we treat it differently than diabetes? It's got some heavy stuff. It definitely has some heavy stuff. So we have to learn how to talk about this issue. When people hear the word heroin, some people run the other way. Heroin is heroin, right? It's a little scary. So what? We gotta talk about it. And that's one of the things I think in writing we've done a better job over the last 10 years is having more conversations about some of this ugly stuff. And I think the other thing we've had a pretty fair conversation about is the behavior of someone struggling with substance use disorder is pretty damaging for families. It's pulling them apart. And our police officers often see people at their worst. And so training them has been a priority for us. We now train every new police officer that comes in. Our chief of police, uh, Chief Cormier, and our deputy chief have been very supportive of allowing us to do that. And one of the things that we share with them is the impact on the family and how they can support and refer people to services. Um, and we also know that it's affecting everyone in the community. So the more that we can do on the stigma piece is very important. I also want to mention in terms of prescription drugs, in 2009 we started our first prescription drop box. Um, the district attorney's office was very helpful. We've collected one million pills. When I heard that number about how many pills were written in uh, Massachusetts, I thought oh, one million is not as much as I thought. You know, if we can collect a million in Reading, there's a lot out there. It's amazing how many pills are out there. But I also know that so many of us as parents, I'm the parent of two teens, we're constantly confronted with all these decisions around our children's health care. Wisdom teeth, they break a foot, whatever it is. And we need to start having those conversations with our providers about handling pain. You know, it's why when we look at our athletes, how are we handling pain? Are we rushing them back too soon? Are we dealing with concussions appropriately? These are all questions that I know our district 
in our town and our police officers and our health leaders are really looking at and grappling with because it is part of that bigger issue in terms of pain management. So I will stop there so we can make sure we get all the questions, but just want to say thank you to all of our um, local coalition leaders that are here in the room tonight. We appreciate your support. Thank you so much, Penny and Erica. All right, well, I, we know that uh, in this room tonight, we have so much experience and expertise with these issues, so this is uh, the opportunity now to hear from you, and the timing is really good. Um, as you probably know, there's a lot of discussion happening right now on Beacon Hill with uh, a whole bunch of legislative proposals, policy proposals. Um, the Senate has actually passed legislation. Governor Baker has proposed a very comprehensive bill and the House of Representatives is very actively considering that. So your feedback's very timely. We're gonna be listening very carefully. And of course, your feedback on what else we can be doing you know, on the ground in our communities and that our other um, speakers tonight can, can also consider. So um, please, uh, just so we can all hear you, I think it'd be great if you could come up to the microphone. So Elaine, maybe you wanna kick us off, that would be great. And maybe you can raise it up. Um, and feel free to ask questions of any panelist or share feed comments with us or feedback, and we'll try to get, you know, uh, everybody, have everybody have an opportunity. So please, go ahead. Okay. So, Elaine Webb, I'm on the Reddit Coalition. I'm on the school committee. I'm a, the mother of um, two 21-year-olds, a 20-year-old, and an 18-year-old. And I just want to say that I think we've looked at the data. The prevention with the teens is so important. And I don't think we're making the progress we need to make with marijuana. I think as a community, as a state, we've made some mistakes with you know how much the civil penalty, how much marijuana you can carry for a civil penalty. Dr. Hill was here, he was recently on the news the other night. I think he has a lot of good things to say. We have to keep focusing on the prevention. But I, I also just wanna say, I, the, our, the packet from the district attorney's office I, I was just about moved to tears reading through some of it. Um, the police officer who said, I don't exactly know what changed me, but now when I go into this situation, I don't look at these at the addicts as criminals. I look at them in a different light. And it, you know, there's a lot that's created that change. So this is a great conversation, but you know, we're here in this school, we're thinking about our teenagers and there are there are um, teenagers amongst us that, that need the resources, the, the uh, recovery, the, the transitional care, and then we're not doing enough with that. But we, but we gotta stop them first. And um, I really appreciate the that, uh, conversations that we're having in the community, but I really wanna make sure we stay focused on that prevention. And I really wanna thank everybody. This is like the best turnout that we've had. So thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Jim Sinclair, I'm from Stone, and I'm the uh, stepfather of a 26-year-old young man who has struggled with uh, substance abuse since his, his late teens. And I want to share with you a conversation that Jason and I have had on a couple of occasions regarding the role of sober houses in the entire recovery process. I, I think it, it's very important because you know, here, in, in, in my case, we have a stepson who's never lived independently and sober in his life. And he comes out of, you know, different treatment programs. He, he, he did two stints at, at Tewksbury, a couple other programs, and he's just not prepared. You know, you come out of that very structured aspect, and then, you know, what, what do you do next? And, you know, the, the last time he came out, he'd come out of a, a treatment program, he'd say, you know, Mom, can, can you, pay for me to go to a sober house. And we, you know, we said, oh, sure. So the first one he went to was down in Dorchester, uh, $150 a week. The, the guy, I met with the guy who ran it, you know, yes, we test every week, you know. Well, everybody in the house knew he wasn't really looking at the results. There were a lot of people in the house that continued to use, eventually, our son used, OD, had to be revived. Yet another cycle, detox, treatment. Goes to, you know, gets out again, and he's got to find another place. So, you know, he goes online, and finds a place in Everett, and he goes there. There's a lot of problems in the house, and the guy who runs it, I don't think he was taking sobriety very seriously, because 
one Saturday, he packed up a van full of the residents and took them down to, to um, downtown to Hemp Fest. Eventually, he gets kicked out of there, another detox, another rehab, and finally, he gets into a really good program down in North Alabama. Didn't want to go. He was kicking and screaming the entire way down. These guys finally got to him. The, the good news is he's now 14 months clean and sober. He's got a <laughs> he's got a job. He saved up the money to buy his own car. He's living in an apartment right down the street from the sober house with a great support network. His roommates are graduates of the program. The, the points I want that there's good sober houses and bad sober houses out there. The, the two bad ones he found just by, you know, going online and searching around trying to find some. The good one that he finally got into was because it, he was referred to it by the people in the treatment program. And my other observation is, I can't open up a, a daycare center without going through some kind of licensing program. These guys who run the sober houses, you know, they, they, they buy a building, they throw a bunch of beds in, and they just start collecting money from them. And the, these people going into these programs are just as vulnerable as the kids who are going to the daycare centers. I would love to see some kind of supervision. I, you know, I, I hate to get so bureaucratic that we lose places because there's not enough places in the sober houses out there right now. But, but my experience has been a bad one is, is just as bad as not having any place to go at all. Finally, I just, I really appreciated Penny's uh, comment about Families Anonymous. That was, my, my wife got involved in a group over in, in Wilmington and it was that group that gave her the tools to finally stop enabling him. And you know, she eventually had to ask him to leave the house and it was one of the most painful things she's ever done. But her son will tell you today it was the best thing she, she ever did for him. And, you know, we really need to be directing more of the families into those types of programs to give them the tools they need. Thank you for coming out tonight. So thank you for sharing that. Um, starting um, in the beginning part of 2016, sober homes will start becoming certified in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And treatment programs will only be able to refer to to certified sober homes. It's been, I mean, I was when I came back into public service in January. I have to say, I was completely stunned that there was this unregulated, private, some good, some bad, some ugly, some should not be in business. Yeah. So starting just after 2000, beginning of 2016, the training actually of the, cert, of the certification process is going on right now. It's better. Alan Swartz, I'm with the Melrose Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. My question is, are you looking outside the Commonwealth for successful solutions to all these problems? Do you mean to offer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a paper we submitted on a uh, restoration center in San Antonio, which have to approximately the revocation rate in that area. Are you looking elsewhere for Alan, successful solutions? For the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the San Antonio one, maybe just say very briefly what it is so folks can hear. Let our speakers you know, talk uh, in the San Antonio. They are restaurant. The, the intake center where you put all the services under one roof. Uh, a gentleman uh, in San Antonio named Bear, about ten or fifteen years ago, was confronting very much the problem we have here, and he began a process which you are beginning now of bringing everyone to the table. It took until 2009 for them to come up with an idea. This is not to say it's the idea that will work in Massachusetts, but the process which you are beginning is the same process Mr. Bear used. 
they created a 34-acre restoration center in downtown San Antonio with everything from detention, infirmary, a court 24 hours a day that met every three hours, fine-grained treatment, homeless shelter, job training, even a shelter for pets. And from 2009 to 2013, number one, the Restoration Center saved Texas $10 million a year till 2013, which is the latest data. And the revocation rate in Texas dropped from 19% to 13%. Now there is a, what I would call a successful solution. It appears to me that there have to be other ones and we have to look for them. And believe me, I'm looking, but I'm wondering whether someone else is because frankly, I could use the help. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your um, discussion of these best practices, which we all need to learn from each other. And um, just to give you some examples, the secretary and I were just in DC for a 50 state convening um, on talking the whole, we spent two and a half days talking about the opiate issues and learning from other states, such as Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and others. And I'll be going next week to another um, uh, public health commissioner national meeting where the main discussion will be opiates. Um, so there's a lot to learn from each other, so I appreciate you highlighting that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Bob Balfour. I'm from Melrose. Um, I'm a big supporter of all the coalitions. Um, I don't have a question. I have um, praise. You, know, you people are amazing. You know, and, and if anybody in this room doesn't know what goes on in the streets, I've been, uh, I've been in recovery for 28 years, but I've been fighting this fight behind the scenes. Um, I just retired from the Department of Correction, a job I got when I first got into recovery. And um, I became a, an addictions counselor, uh, not to use it and not to be a counselor, but just, I have a passion for helping kids. Um, I buried a brother who was probably about 12 years ago, uh, was older than me, he was my idol. But um, he got into the heroin and the pills and all that. But, uh, you know, probably 13 years ago, we lost uh, our first kid from Melrose, Captain Hockey Baseball. Uh, great looking kid, very well known family. And, um, and his mother asked me, we put on a small recovery walk, and his mother said, you know, what do we do with these kids? You know, and uh, I said, they all go to this young people, AA, NA, and whatever, and uh, so we go and sat and I went to a, um, a, a local official, and I mentioned, you know, if you need any, any help, and I went to the school and all that, no way, we don't want, no, no, not, you know, advertising that we help the kids around here with drugs, and we just, it's like a denial thing, it's going to go away by itself, you know, when it hasn't, and, um, you know, since then, uh, I, I get phone calls from the principal to, um, often, think, you know, for the past couple of years, to bring, you know, can you send a few of the girls down that are in recovery to talk to, just like an off the record, behind the scenes, and, and it works, you know, and um, the mayor in Melrose, it's like, you know, I, I, my thing is fitness and recovery, I'm, we have a runners and recovery group of triathletes, Ironman, and um, I have recovery, you know, triathletes and sports folks all over the country, all over the world now, you know, and, uh, but I, I spoke to Mayor Dolan and he said, Bobby, if you want to have a road race to help with addiction and run down Main Street, it's yours, you know, and we didn't get that response. Um, Ten years ago, nobody wanted to talk about it, but to praise you guys, I, I spent my time with the state and um, I know it's, it's, you know, it's a tough job, but um, to be standing here saying we're talking to the business owners about the locks on the bathroom doors. That's insane to talk about, to even think about, but it, that saves lives, you know that. And, and anyone that doesn't, you know, I tell people that story all the time, that, that 
this locks and you go to Dunkin' Donuts down, it's, it's, you gotta press a buzzer or whatever. That's why, you know, and, and um, that small little thing like that saves lives. And there's so much that is being done now. And I spent so many years up and down Route 1. Danvers, here we go, you drop somebody off, they get home before I did, you know? And um, it was amazing. And they had people working on that, you know, to working on the recovery centers and stuff like that. I was out at, um, in LA two weeks ago at Homeboys. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, um, what a program, beautiful building. And it's all very hardcore gang members. And they have a, a restaurant, the, the Home Girls is a bakery. They do all kinds of job training and all kinds of stuff like that. And um, when I worked for Corrections, I, I created the work group program. And just on respect, on t you know, working with these guys who are all addicts, naturally. But um, I've seen, again, I just want to say thank you and thank you. And, and these things were unheard of to get people to talk about it. Police officers would not keep, just, probably just over a year ago, I sat with a police officer who was a friend of mine, and he said, no way will we carry Narcan. That's EMS, the fire department doesn't even want to do it. I asked him, he said, yeah, we all carry it. I'm like, he said, no way, yeah, you know what I meant. It's like, you know, and yeah, I know what you meant, you know, but it, it, it's small little things like that are huge, you know, and, and I don't know, so, so thank you, um, again, um, it's just a passion of mine, you know, and, um, I buried so many, I, I, you know, a girl that, 14 years old, she was heroin, she lived with us, you know, and, and she died in law school. She died from hepatitis, she was clean five years, you know, but, um, you know, it, it's amazing, but again, and, I, and when I talk to people about it, the, the tide is about to turn, you know, but we've spent the past at least five years when this, you know, tornado struck, we got to unwind a lot. You know, and, and the stigma is huge. Thank you so much. You know, so. I love your idea of the, of the race, too. Yeah. And also, uh, it's like when the lemon in here, it's like when the lemon work out, but they would love to help with that as well. I'm Thank you. I'm off my help, too, so. Run. Yeah, run, run. We run with you. We've got a volunteer run. We're in. Second week is two. Let's not make it too long. Yeah. <laughs> a 5K, man. I am in. All the way. The lady do the Iron Man, we'll do the 5K. I did not, I'm on the record, Thank you. I did not sign up for an Iron Man. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary DeMarco. I live in Reading. I actually grew up in Reading, moved away from Reading, and moved back to Reading about 19 years ago. I um, suffer the loss of my daughter and granddaughter. I'm very impressed with what you have said in regard to mental illness and all of which a lot of people do not see an individual as an individual. And my daughter was one of those individuals that had so many issues, unfortunately. And throughout the entire crisis of our horror of trying to save her life, you know, I'm talking 12 years, I had never heard of any of this. I was unaware. I live in Reading. Um, my last name is very well known with the police department. She was incarcerated from the age of 18, a month after she turned 18. She went to Framingham Prison. She was in and out of jail up until right before she died. She was eight and a half months pregnant. She died. The baby died. They died of straight fentanyl. The baby died of 46% fentanyl, which from what the autopsy report indicated is 80 to 200 times as potent as morphine, which I'm very, very impressed with all of what you've indicated in regards to pregnant women and the hospitals and all of what you're gonna do as far as, you know, starting from the beginning, being there to help them, giving them resources, I helped my daughter like there was no tomorrow. I mean, I won a lottery. She went out to California for 30 days to the tune of $25,000. We had a live intervention with Kevin Dixon, who runs the show, Kevin um, Intervention. It was a pilot mode show at the time, probably way back in 2005. Paid for my entire family of five to fly to LA. There was a stage with an audience, the whole nine yards. Alicia was not willing to go. And Maria, the spokeswoman that was trying to get the show going, told her that if you don't go, then we will have a private investigator follow you 24-7 to make sure you go right back to jail. So she did finally, after three hours, she went. And she went to a beautiful establishment in um, 
Palm Springs, California to the tune of $25,000 for one month that we did not have to pay. There were lots of miracles. I had brain mapped, I did everything in my power to try to save my daughter. But things started early on. Her birth, the cord was wrapped around her neck. I had multiple neurological evaluations. She was not successful academically. She never did well in school. I mean, we tripled our mortgage payment to move from a thorn to Reading so that my kids got what I thought I got to be raised in a great community. Unfortunately, at the time, services were just not there. She was just always under, you know, behind the eight ball, so to speak, always, unfortunately. You know, that's just, it's sad. And, and I've gotten very involved over the past four or five months. I've met a lot of women that are in my position that have lost their children. I actually went out to D.C. I spent the two days, the first weekend in October, with a fed up rally. We um, met lots of people, Dr. Oz, lots and lots of people. I mean, I think the general population doesn't believe in recovery. They don't realize the amount of people that are legitimately in recovery, like, you know, one of the speakers you just had. For years, I mean, I myself never thought for a minute that, you know, you think and you hope that that one and however are gonna be successful. But there's, I believe the figure is 1.3 million that are and have been in recovery for long terms. So there is hope, you know, and I'm so happy to be here with regards to all of the things that are gonna happen. Uh, we also went and met with Governor Baker at the Kennedy Center. Um, and he, you were there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was there too. <laughs> My friend Cheryl was, was actually on the news. She met with him and another one of the women that I met. And, you know, it's, it's a very, very devastating thing to have lived with. And my, my family suffered so much. And I myself, it was like she was my best friend and I did everything in my power, you know, just to try to save her. And I always hung on to that little piece of help, hope. And, you know, to have a poor little baby, six pound baby, just die like that is just, I, I can't get over it. It's only been a year, so I'm still struggling with, with the grief. But um, um, aside from that, I was wondering, with regard to fentanyl, do you fo foresee an antidote for fentanyl? Because if someone did, as in my daughter's situation, have straight fentanyl in the system, then Narcan does not work. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your story and your experiences. Um, so uh, fentanyl works in the same way at the brain level, and then Narcan can work. You're right to say it's so strong that sometimes the intranasal Narcan used to, need to be used two or three times, and sometimes you need to go to the intramuscular Narcan. So the hope is, as we train people to use Narcan, to remind them to first call for help, 911, so that more um, enforcements come as well. But unfortunately, there are no um, other treatments other than that. So are you saying fentanyl is an opiate? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Because I've been led to believe that it was not. No, it is a very, it's a very powerful opiate. Okay, I guess I was misled then. Um, also, and, and also, as um, the district attorney mentioned, is now law in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts around fentanyl being illegal. So that's um, so Narcan can reverse, but we're also we just got to get it not available for people. Yes, one of the wonderful women that I've met, Catherine Fennelly, was on the panel with you, and she actually was there when they passed the bill. Also, what really kills me, just as a parent, is the fact that, you know, when they do, you know, the police departments, I'm sure, work really hard with the stings and trying to find all the drug dealers, and, you know, all of a sudden they've, they've found it after hours and hours of work, 25 kilos of heroin or whatever else they've got, and millions of dollars worth of street drugs that are going out there to kill our children. Why in God's name is there even a bail for these people? And why do they let them out, and they know that they're coming from Mexico? Why would they possibly, possibly say, okay, you can walk out the door and here's your bail, and you get your drug money to pay your bail, and then you can go out and kill some more kids. What's that all about? I mean, shouldn't there be no bail if you've got 25 kilos of heroin or whatever the hell they got? It's insane. They're killing our children, just like we said, four people a day in Massachusetts. In the year 2014, 1,256 people died of an overdose. That's disgusting. Just 
in Massachusetts. So, as I mentioned, our enforcement efforts with our law enforcement partners are really focused now on getting these big supplies off. And I think that we do a good job in doing that. I think we make those bail arguments in terms of the strength of our case. One of the good pieces of working together is that when we bring that case in, we usually have a very strong case to show the judge that hopefully will encourage he or she not to set bail in an amount that they can make. And I think, you know, one of the pieces of, that it strikes me in so much of the work we do here is what you're doing. I think for any parent who, for those of us who haven't experienced the loss of a child, you can't imagine. And I think for somebody who loses a child, that the one piece of hope then or consolation is that you're able to take the experience of that loss and turn it to good. Because those, ch your children that you lose, deserve to be mourned for a very, very long time. And in your case, your child and grandchild. So uh, we really owe a debt to you for taking that grief, for taking that loss, and honoring your daughter and your grandchild by bringing that to us and then trying to help with this work. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. I also have Alicia's daughter that she had five years ago, and I have had her since birth. As your people said earlier in the conversation, there's a lot of grandparents raising these children, and then there's also a lot of children that no one's raising. And, you know, they're going from foster home to foster home, and, and it's pretty sad for the children. You know, the children are the ones that really, really suffer. Well, and one of the things I would encourage you, though, is you have a very full plate, and it's always important to be taking care of the caretaker. So there are lots of services, you know, as the Senator mentioned, there are lots of services for, parent, for grandparents who are raising those children. You know, you can't, it's like when you're on the plane and the oxygen mask comes down, you can't help anybody else if you don't help yourself. No, I, so, I, I, I don't. So, you know, I'm, not just for you, but I encourage everybody. Many, many people know people in that setting. And there are lots of services that are available. Senior centers now are offering lots of services for that. So people need to know that and to take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing a psychiatrist and therapist for the last 15 years because of the horror that I've lived with, with my daughter. So, I mean, I do get the services, but I am kind of surprised that I was so unaware of all of this prior to her dying. Like, I do nothing about this stuff. Like, you know, my kids were not in the school system, they were already out of the school system. So how does one know, the average person, like, why don't they know about this stuff if they're dealing with the crisis that I was dealing with? Yeah. I dealt with it for so many years, but yet the only suggestion I got from my therapist was go to an al meeting, go to an al meeting. And that's the purpose of some of these and some of the work that we're doing is to get, and sometimes the other piece of it is what we hope to accomplish is that people have this information because sometimes when you're deep in your own crisis, you can't receive anything else. Exactly. So it's important that people have this information ahead of time. So how do, they, how do they find out, like, like I said? Well, like these nights, yeah. And right, there's a number what of... What I'm saying, for me, living what I lived, if I was someone else that's living like that now, they're not knowledgeable enough to know all these things. And that's why we're, we're training police officers now. That's why first responders are receiving enhanced training. It's why um, town social workers, city supportive services, elder services, town librarians are now getting this type of information so that anywhere you go in a community, you will see one of these green resource manuals, which has all of the resources, because I think Marion said it best, when you're deep in it, it's very difficult to see, and especially when your kids are not connected to the school system, because that's often a, a way that we get right. it. The other thing, and I just want to honor the work that Melrose Wakefield is doing, they birthed the third highest rate of substance abuse exposed newborns in the state, and they just received a grant as part of the process that Marion talked about, where they're offering supportive services, where moms in recovery are doing support work with other moms to help motivate them into recovery, and also also provide supportive services and follow the children, I believe, till age five, and then they'll be transitioned to additional services. That's really more comprehensive than we had two, three years ago, and so I think we're getting there with, with trying to reach earlier. Also, our preschool educators need the resources, uh, our, our Head Start resources, they, they all need to be part of this process. That's why for us, our coalition, has 12 sectors represented from faith leaders to people who work with the town recreation because we need to try to reach across all of these different sectors 
But when it comes right down to it, this issue of addiction, what I've observed, it's very isolating for the average person. Oh, it's, it's very it's isolating. Really and so no matter how many forms we have, there still may be other people we can't reach. And so one of the things that I've always encouraged people who know about this work is tell your neighbor, tell someone else that you've heard about these resources because that may be how you hear about it. And I also believe that we're looking for treatment and support with dignity. So when we talk about referring people to services or letting someone know about something, we're not saying go to that place that I wouldn't send my own child, right? right? It's about a place that's gonna treat the family and the child or the adult child with dignity. And I think that's part of what this collaborative work is about. Right. So we're getting uh, close to eight, and I know some people are starting to leave. Thank you. Um, just wanted to thank you so much for sharing. We're, we're so sorry for your loss as well. Is there anyone else who wanted to? Great. Okay. Um, so anyone after the three folks who are standing, anybody else? Okay. So great. Let's. Um, um, yes, my name is Kendra Cooper. I, I do elder advocacy, and one area I'd sort of like to switch over to the other perspective and the um, the elder end of things, especially one speaker previously mentioned that a lot of the prescriptions are people 50 or 70. I'd venture to say it gets up to the 90s. But, um, but my concern is also seeing prescribers who, um, you know, who prescribed phenylalanine, uh, benzodiazepines, hydrocodones, these, these in, in nursing homes, um, but also taking a perspective of uh, people being medicated like this and then requiring or people gaining powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, and guardianships, and then financially exploiting people. Um, I believe that's, that is a national problem. It's something that I don't see really really addressed well. Uh, often the exploiters are family members, but, um, but I'm, I'm wondering what you see as far as you know, uh, diagnoses of dementia, which really are more drug-induced, or, or even something like benzodiazepine can cause people to fall. There are so many uh, aspects of drugs that are um, that you know, medications that occur, and then I see elders losing their homes or elders being, you know, going to facilities and, and marrying So elders. I spent 18 years before I became the district attorney running our elder mm -hmm. disabled unit. And you're right, people become very susceptible to that kind of um, influence. And often it's more influence than anything else. Somebody yeah, has, You know, we all know people that have dementia who have good days and bad days and good hours and bad hours. So there's been lots of effort. We've partnered with many of our legislative partners are working for pieces of that. We've changed some of those statutes. It's, it's a very difficult area. It's a very fine line between people's independence, their right to make a bad choice in terms of who they entrust their assets to, and then people who are truly being disadvantaged. There are also very difficult cases to prosecute because typically, and I spend a lot of my time, I was at the senior center yesterday, talking about these issues, a lot of times they don't come to light until the person is very, very deep in their illness when they passed away. And suddenly the daughter discovers that the bank account that she thought was very full is completely empty. So we continue to work in that area, both in terms of, and very similar to this, in terms of education, trying to prevent those issues, because it's hard to ever recoup that money when people have been influenced in that way and also educating healthcare professionals. We have a hospital-based task force to talk about some of those issues as well. Yeah, I, I think what I'm seeing over the past five years, though, is I'm seeing more uh, things like now people, combinations of drugs that are being used on people who ultimately are in nursing homes, phenylalanine and patch combinations with benzos, and, and, uh, and I'm seeing prescribers who perhaps, because the population is getting older, they may not be as aware of, uh, of how medication affects people of that age. But still, it's, it's an area that, as, you know, as we consider where the population's finances are, it's, it's, it's there. And, and I'm seeing it in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine, and, and, and actually nationally, it's, it's getting a lot of attention. Well, I'm wondering, next, by 2030, the population of people over the age of 60 in Massachusetts will be exactly the same as the present population of Middlesex County, 1.7 million people. And it is the exact same thing. What we are telling people is don't wait till you're 80 figure out how to plan for your assets when you're in that situation. It really is education and prevention, doing things while you are well. Are you doing anything about educating your prescribers and educating yes, the police yes, and, and, and even protective services? I know the commission report came out last year uh, talking about lack of training, and I know that they're supposed to be doing something with that. But I promise you, we have a hospital-based task force educating the providers. We educate bank officials. 
and we educate the staff of assisted living and nursing homes and all of that to be alert for that kind of influence. We prosecuted and take it to the Supreme Judicial Court several cases in the last three years talking about what's influence, when is somebody with a morphine drip in their arm under an influence. So it's an emerging kind of area as, as this changes and as the population gets older. Thank, thank you. you. Nancy, doctor, I wanted to thank you as a clinician, actually, for your work with insurance companies to streamline the authorization process. Thank you very much. So I hope you will be as successful. Yes, it is actually. Um, so thank you. And I hope you would be as successful um, in my two other concerns. One is actually if you could work with the Mass Medical Society to get the number of physicians who are certified to prescribe Suboxone to get them to take insurance particularly mass health. I understand the rationale to get as many physicians to prescribe Suboxone as possible, even if they're ill-equipped to deal with addictions. But this has become a cash cow for physicians, and I have several colleagues in a lot of clinics that they're turning down up to 30 or more patients every month because these patients are looking for people who will take their insurance. So I don't know what type of incentive that you can have Physicians are free not to take insurance, but it's a really, it's a big issue. Um, the other issue that I would like to just, I guess, present to you is that well over a year ago, the uh, uh, American Medical Society, you know, published data that showed that states that had um, established medical marijuana dispensaries saw a very significant um, reduction in their overdoses, up to 33% a year. That would translate to what, three, 400 people here in Massachusetts this past year? I'm really concerned that the state has dragged their feet. Oh, no, 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 no. Not, not talking about Salem. No. Not talking about Salem, but I'm very concerned I, that this is proven, I, this gonna, is proven data. I'm gonna take a first answer and I'm gonna ask. So the, 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 I wanna give credit to yes. Secretary Sutton's Commissioner Burrell because the they Salem, inherited yes. a very broken yes. medical marijuana implementation. And is, I'm not placing blame, no, there were a lot of reasons, but, but they, they really took hold of this right in the beginning, and I've been out to visit a you number of these dispensaries, and, and we've made um, yes. tremendous progress because they've changed the whole approach and the whole system to how we license dispensaries. And, but you know and that that's very clear data, and that's actually information. I, that, yes. There's no, no disagreement on this. Mm -hmm. um, so today, Massachusetts, um, thank you for the, um, so first of all, thank you. Um, Massachusetts now has four um, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. There are, you can go on the Department of Public Health website, you can see the number of licenses in process, where they are, when they're scheduled to open. Um, it is, you know, the citizens, it is a completely transparent process. It is, um, it is fixed and it's rolling out. Um, so, so there's an urgency, and I hope you. I, I and we've so we've, we've, we've taken urgency. off every um, potential barrier there is in terms of regulatory stuff. Um, and on Suboxone, we're several things are in the works to try to. So we've removed also, and you, I don't know if you've seen this, and this is maybe too wonky for some people. So there's also a new bulletin out for Mass Health around. Um, uh, expanding um, medication assisted treatments and if at the end if you give me your card I'll give you mine I'll send that to you as well as increasing um, the prescribers who can um, prescribe suboxone so there's a couple things that in the works that take mass health yeah. that's that's the issue that take mass health thank you thank you so much for your viewing questions thanks uh, thanks for doing this tonight appreciate it it's uh, very good for me and um, I've learned a lot as well the reason I'm here tonight is why I'm before you is uh, I think I, I live in the city of Melrose and um, I think we need a little bit of help. So I went to a similar conference like this uh, in Melrose in the end of August and I was disturbed to learn that the funding for our Melrose Substance Abuse uh, Prevention Coordinator um, is running out. 75% um, of her salary is grant funded through one grant which is sun sunsetting and the other 25% I understand is a part of that MAPC, MOPC grant. So we've talked tonight about how uh, important prevention is, and yet on the local level, uh, we are threatened of losing our substance abuse prevention coordinator. 
And that scares me as a resident of Melrose because I know the work that Jen does and it's very good work and I'm gonna be sitting with our chief financial officer of the city to try to find a way that we can hopefully bring this position like Erica's, um, you know, within, or excuse me, yours, I apologize, uh, you know, full time. But, you know, there's a cost to that. And um, I'm looking to fiscal year 2017. I know that uh, you know, Governor Baker has talked about, you know, increasing local aid um, in, in these, these programs and these bills, is there grant funding? Is there something that we can do as a city that we can rely on this for? I mean, we talk about the importance of prevention. We are threatened of losing our coordinator. I'm, I'm asking for help. I'm, I'm open to ideas. I, I'm, you know, I, I just anything that can be done would be very helpful. Um, so if you would give us your card, um, give it to the commissioner or myself, yeah. um, we can figure out what the funding has been and see what we can do to be helpful. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Can I say something about that? Yeah. Is that I can talk about it. As someone who's chased grants to stay alive in this business, it's 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 not great to have a grant, to be honest with you. Um, it's You have to be able to adapt your focus to fit that grant's need, and while it still right. makes you viable and everything like that, it's it's got to be somehow, some way um, sustainable, whether that be a mandate from the state to say towns who have public health departments need to have this of their, their structure, but, you know, I mean, the towns don't necessarily have the funding to do it, but it's worth it. Yeah, oh, yeah, we're, we're looking at it. We're looking you know? at it. Yeah, okay. we are. And we don't, we don't like the, being susceptible to grants for sunset, for sure. Yeah. It, it's different in each community in terms of how it's funded. Yeah. Erica, how, how, how are you funded, your position? I'm currently funded under our drug-free communities grant, but a few years ago when we did not have grant funding, our... Um, town manager, our police chief, and our school superintendent um, asked for funding for our staff as part of a community behavioral health package. And so our salaries were funded until we could regain that grant funding. But I echo Penny's <laughs> uh, sentiment in that you do have to focus on what the grant wants you to focus on. And the ideal setting for all communities is to have a coordinator who can really focus on what the town wants you to focus on. Um, because you can make a little bit more headway. Um, although we're very grateful for the federal and the state resources, um, you know, 50% of what you do is a lot of the regulatory stuff. It's, it's heavy. Load. <laughs> so. You have to have a professional credential to be able to do this work. You know, it's, it is science. So we need to have a certified prevention specialist or a master's degree in this work to be able to do it do it well, you know, and, and that we should be paid for that. Yeah, I think it's, I I think it's, a, I think it's a great point, and, and you know, I think we should be thinking about it as a, as a core function of the health department and the Board of Health in our communities. And we know they're already underfunded in many of our boards of health. Um, and, 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 and I'm not opposed to finding revenue streams within the city either. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all out, I'm all out, you know, so. Okay. All thank, right, I well, we're pushing it. up, thank you so much. Um, we're pushing up against eight, so. Um, One thing regarding what you just said. Yeah, okay, just very quick, because there were- Real quick, real quick. Uh, I've been working with the North Reading Police Department, because that's where my daughter and granddaughter passed away, was in North Reading. And um, they're excellent policemen and detectives, and I'm at the chief of police and everything else. And, they can't even have a coalition because apparently a coalition costs one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. That seems pretty sad, doesn't it? So how does that work? I'm just because you're talking about the funding, it's kind of yeah. like I'll, I'll well, chat with you offline we'll, and, and talk we'll with you about that. that. Yes. Thank so, you, everybody. Thank you all so much for having our uh, speakers tonight. We're fantastic. They're so generous with their time. So thank you so much to Secretary Sutters, Commissioner Burrell, District Attorney Ryan, Penny Funiel, and Erica McNamara. Thank you all. Thank you. And um, RCTV, thank you so much. It did take tonight. So if there is someone you know who would be interested who wasn't able to make it, this will be online as well and on local cable TV. Good night, everybody.